All right. Thank you very much for joining me, Bobby Capuccio, coach of coaches within the fitness industry, one of the co-founders of PTA Global and behavior change expert. I'm just throwing that in there. Thank you very much for taking the time to hang out. Today we're discussing all things adaptability. All things adaptability. Lots of things adaptability, particularly. This could go on it, it could go on. It could go on. So I just want to find out, Bobby, obviously with the way that the world is now, we're coming into a little bit of a new reality. So we're having to look at things through a different lens. We're having to adapt to the ever-changing reality. And there's a lot of uncertainty. So with particularly to the fitness industry, what do you think adaptability means? What does it mean to you? Well, to me, adaptability is synonymous with resilience, which is like how much deformation can a structure take and still return back to functionality? So how much stress can an individual, an organization, an industry take and still maintain its workability? Now, workability is probably not a real word. I wouldn't even try using that in Scrabble, but I think workability is an appropriate word because it deals with our ability to function and function at an optimal level. And right now we're all under stress. The world is under stress. And what's exacerbating the stress is it wasn't predictable. It's quite salient and it's immersive. You can't seem to get away from it. So no matter what you do or what outlet you plug into, you're exposed to it all the time. And it's affecting you in ways that not only was the onset not predictable, but where it's going is unpredictable as well. So we're in unprecedented types as well as depths of stress and how well we can adapt and still remain functional and of value. Not, not only is that the definition of resilience, it could possibly be the definition of mental health. So we're all being tested in a way. It seems like a, a, like a, a global test and particularly with resilience and our health and well-being, our mental health, how is this going to impact our level of health and fitness? What are we going to do to improve that? Well, let me take that off. I'm not nowhere near two meters of any. <laughs> actually. The office is, I'm, I'm in a building by myself right now. But every time I try to play futurist, very rarely I get something right. I mean, <laughs> sometimes you say ridiculous things and they come true, but very often I get things wrong. But I'm optimistic, even though I acknowledge and it, it seems insensitive to say I'm optimistic right now because so many people are struggling and there are people that are going to lose their business. There are people who already have lost their business. But we're, we're at a junction right now where our environment is forcing some changes in the way we see the world, in the way we strategize, and the way we engage with people. So here's off the top of my head an example. We all love to talk about blockbuster video and how they should have seen Netflix coming. You know, they should have acquired Netflix. They should have been able to pivot. And it's very easy in retrospect to criticize an organization. You have to understand that if you were an executive at blockbuster video back in the day, your entire mental model, your culture, your operations were all based around the perspective that people walk into the four walls of the environment, they stroll through aisles, they pick up boxes that they hope nobody else has checked out so they can go home and watch a film. And that's the way home video rental worked. Not to mention that 12% of their revenues, which is enormous, came from late fees. So you had to ask people to readjust their entire mental model where for Netflix, I'm not saying it was easy, but it was easier because they didn't have this pre-existing cultural, operational, mental model that they needed to work with it. So they can reinvent the rules of an industry so much easier than the person who dominated that industry in the first place. The last people who would ever see, you know, Airbnb was the hotel industry. The last people who would ever perceive um, Uber would be the taxi commissions. 
So I think where we want that is you have people who want to engage in some form of transformation, but for a lot of them and most of them, that involves walking into a physical environment. And within the trans theoretical model of change, where you are within your own journey determines what you're prepared or not prepared to do. There's a lot of people who are approaching or exploring change, but they're not quite ready to walk into a health club. And if you've ever sold memberships, you've heard if somebody drives into the car park and they get out of their car and they take one of the longest and most terrifying walks of their life in through the front door of a health club, they're there to join. And if, and if they didn't join, you failed to convince them that they needed to join that day with you. That doesn't support the empirical evidence. Again, it supports our experience and conditioning in a pre-existing, deeply entrenched mental model, but it doesn't support what the research is saying. When, when people are taking steps towards transformation, the first phase of that transformation is cognitive. Like this is where they read something and it inspires them or they explore something or they ask questions. It's only later on within that process that transformation lives where it needs to and that's behavior. So virtual has been a way for a long time to, to not only augment the way we serve the people who are in our environment, but the people who would be in our environment, but they're not ready. They're delaying, but a delay is a delay. A delay is not a denial. Wow. So, in terms of this. in terms of the kind of fitness professional, so it, that that's almost like a viewpoint of the person who's seeking transformation. For example, the the client or the person who would join the gym. And but there's also there also seems to be an opportunity or a challenge for the fitness professional to adapt in this environment. So are there fitness professionals now who are at different states of being prepared to adapt to what's coming? And what could we do to help them maybe grab the bull by the horns and, and use this opportunity to kind of grow and evolve their business? I think the short answer to that, and, and this is an easy one, so I'm just gonna go a little bit more in depth. There are people who are more adept at transformation and adaptation and others. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because <clears throat> there are different personalities that exist within an organization. And not every personality that exists within an organization is entrepreneurial. And that's okay. You know, a lot of times people work very well within a pre-established structure that's been laid out for them. They're intrapreneurs, not entrepreneurs. But the people who are more entrepreneurial are logically going to have an easier time reinventing themselves. I think for the people who are struggling, it begins with a question, which is what, what do you define as your role? What do you do? And it sounds like such a stupid question. What do you mean, what do I do? That should be intuitive and obvious. But in working with health club chains around the world, what I've noticed is whatever you think should be obvious probably isn't. Case in point, on many different occasions, I've asked rooms full of fitness managers, sometimes 60, 70, 80 of them from different locations to define something. So such as what is personal training? And they would have to write it down and rip it off as, into a piece of paper and drop it into a basket. So no one could base their answers based on whatever came before them. And we would pull them out randomly. And very often we would get not two of the same responses in a room. That's shocking. So there's not a lot of clarity on what it is we do. So if what it is we do is training or instructing or God forbid a certain modality, like you know, I do CrossFit or I teach you know, Soul Cycle, we might have a hard time. But if what it is we do is more expansive, inclusive, and malleable in its nature is I give people the resources to be at their most resourceful in identifying what it is they want and co-creating strategies to, to actually get that. Well, 
it doesn't matter what's happening with technology and it doesn't matter what's happening with COVID. People will always have value hierarchies. There'll always be something that somebody wants. There'll be barriers, environmental and internal, that stop them from getting that. And they might need a tour guide through that journey, which is someone who understands the train better than they do and can ask them questions and engage in inquiry, reflection, affirmation, able to summarize and clarify the picture so that individual now knows how to tap into those resources that are around them, and in some cases, that reside with you. Oh, technology. Creates a much more, is that me or you? Uh, that was me that froze. But we're still going. Oh, All good. Not that we work. This is not supposed to happen. <laughs> the joys of Zoom. Does that make sense? It does. So, um, so if I hear you correctly, there is an element of uh, people who have that natural entrepreneurial kind of streak will be a little bit quicker to adapt to the environment and anyone who's more of an entrepreneur who works better within a kind of structured environment it would be a great idea for them to seek out some uh, uh, some coaching or someone who can be a little bit of a tour guide and help mm -hmm. them with these transitions so that they can meet the environment in, in a more prepared way. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes. If they're deciding that they want to stay in the industry, which is transforming from what it was to whatever it's becoming, there are people, who, especially from the onset of social media, who know how to communicate through other mediums outside of face-to-face -face interaction. That expertise is out there. And I don't know if you need a coach or you need a business advisor. A lot of times we use those terms synonymously. They're not the same thing. Experts and coaches do not necessarily live in the same space, although that space does overlap. And sometimes they are the same person, but those resources are out there. And, and I guess the other thing to your point around understanding what it is that we do and having a more expansive view of, you know, helping people transform um, and knowing that that is the outcome and then just having a clear outcome. And then I guess what you're saying is that the path and the means to do that will become evident. So if, you, if, you, if you're clear about what it is that you do, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to adapt to the environment. Not, not only is it gonna be easier for you to adapt to the environment, but semantics are everything. Because our use of languaging dictates our mental maps and how we navigate through a terrain. So if you, if you have two different people in the same environment with two completely different mental maps, they can arrive at very different conclusions and strategies in pretty similar circumstances. You know, so I was having a conversation earlier with someone that I work with, and we were talking about behavior change. And, and this is not me on my soapbox. Obviously, I have a predisposition and biases towards coaching and behavior change, but it, it came up where every change has to be preceded by a behavior change. And, and we weren't we're even talking about fitness. We were talking about me relocating, which is very stressful right now. And you know, I'm primarily because I did it just a couple of months ago from Singapore. And that's a major change. But in order for me to, to successfully navigate through that change, it requires a change with me first. I need to change my behaviors before anything else changes. And when you hear that, it's like, no kidding. But no matter what you do, you're always in the behavior change business. And, and because people do things for their reasons and their value hierarchy and not for your reasons or your expertise or because of how persuasive or well-researched you are, coaching is at the core of everything we do. But a lot of coaches have not engaged in coaching. We have in terms of title, but not in terms of empirically based practices. And virtual is a great time to start doing that. So. I'm thinking that a lot of companies, as well as individuals, are going to be more open to coaching than they have in the past. So the opportunities are there. The coaching is a new 
kind of frontier for some of these personal trainers who may have only seen their business around providing a workout. So there's a new opportunity in terms of coaching through the virtual world that maybe wasn't there before. What if I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little bit nervous about this, this kind of coaching stuff. I'm not really sure if I want to, I just want to teach people how to do squats and, and deadlifts. Is this, is, is this for me? Well, one, that's a very good question. Is it for me? Does this match my identity? Who it is I want to be? And for some people, they're going to arrive at the answer. Well, no, I don't really think, I don't really think that is my gig. And that's fine. For other people, you know, there are two questions. One, can you remember a time when you were first getting started in the fitness industry, the one that you're accustomed to, and you were afraid, and you were challenged, and you were entering into an environment, into a domain, if you will, where you didn't feel you had the knowledge and expertise to the same degree that other people did, yet, you still, in retrospect, manage to find strategies and resources to help you succeed. What exactly did you do? Who was around you? Who were your support mechanisms? What within your environment was most useful in helping you do that? And what were the inner strengths that you, not as a professional, but as a human being possessed, that you were able to leverage and allow you to go from uncertainty, anxiety, let's be honest, maybe even a little bit of fear, to the type of person who became so well established in what you're currently doing that you're reluctant to change it at this point. So something made you successful enough, despite the fact that you didn't have all the knowledge and resources, because nobody does when they're first starting out, but you're successful enough that you're really comfortable living within that circle of influence. How do you identify those factors that help you go from the person you are to the person you are, and how can you leverage those resources to go from the person you are to the person you most want to be in the future? So do you think, Bobby, in terms of helping people maybe overcome their fear of adapting to this new environment, maybe doing things more virtually, maybe doing things more online, maybe looking at kind of coaching modalities, helping them kind of overcome the fear and adapt rapidly to the environment. They could perhaps recall a time when they had a success or when they, um, they achieved something that they thought was very difficult or almost impossible to do. What is it do they, that they need to bring from that situation into this kind of current situation? Yeah. Yes. That's a spot on reflection because I think if you're not concerned right now and you don't have anxiety about yourself or how this affects your clients, that's more troubling than entering into an unprecedented situation and being naturally anxious and concerned, if not for yourself, but for the people that you serve. So if you're feeling anxious right now, if you're feeling apprehensive, if you're feeling a little bit of doubt, I think you're normal. Because the only type of person that enters into a situation they've never been before, and they're faced with all types of challenges that not only potentially threaten them, but people who they're supposed to care about may have zero doubt, those are con artists. Those are called frauds. So the fact that you're feeling something that's extremely uncomfortable means you're probably sincere in doing what you're doing, but you're you're also someone who's overcome every challenge that you've ever faced to get to the point to where you are right now. If you're watching this and you've got a roof over your head and you do have a business or have had a business up until COVID, you've been successful in some pretty challenging circumstances before. If you identify exactly what that is and say, well, what is the best I've ever performed in the worst of situations, that leaves clues. There are qualities that you have intrinsically and things within your environment that you've leveraged externally to allow you to do that. If you're clear on what that is, you can use that. And do you think that it's, um, oh, more technology treasures there, bit of a freeze. Was that a freeze or a pregnant no, pause? It was a freeze. freeze. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to react to it. I was like, wow, we're really sitting in it right now. We are sitting in it. And so, and I guess, 
you know, with the environment the way it is and the focus and energy of the coach or the personal trainer, if I hear you correctly, it's almost like they really need to take stock of where they're at right now and work on themselves kind of internally, maybe going back, thinking about the successes they had, maybe accepting the fact that they're a little bit stressed out, maybe there could be a little bit of fear, and then they need to do a bit of work internally on themselves first so that they have a better understanding of how to approach their clients. Because not only, not only they have to having to um, you know, manage their, their own reality, but then they're also being um, seen as leaders and coaches and role models from their clients. So it's almost like um, it, it, it could feel compounded for these trainers. Well, being an example is one thing. Um, I would say that whatever you think this situation means for you, that's probably what it means for you. Years ago, I was doing a workshop with Craig Hopper. Where was this one? It was in Melbourne. And he had an example, and I thought it was brilliant. He brought up four people from the audience, and he had them sit down in chairs. They said, well, basically, I'm the boss. And these four people work for me. And unfortunately, I've got to lay all four of these people off. And he points to the first person. He says, well, I talked to him. And this guy just goes mental. He starts screaming at me in the office. He's like, this is like the end, you know, like how's he gonna get another job in this economic climate? And how dare I do this to him? He's put in all this hard work and now it's completely over and it's for nothing. And it's like, you know, I have to call security in because this guy's looking to like, you know, find a brick, bring him into my office and beat me to death with it. And then <clears throat> the next person, <laughs> after my first meeting did not go very well, well, I tell her, unfortunately, I'm going to have to sack her. And she says, oh, you know what? I've been meaning to go back to school. And I, I guess this is just a chance for me to pause and learn some new skills and reinvent myself as a person. And, you know, I'll figure out what I'm going to do after that. And then, you know, another person, you know, I tell them to come into the office. And I give them the bad news. I've got to sack them. So, oh, you know what? I've been so stressed out. I've been so disconnected from my family. And you know, they, you know, this is a perfect opportunity for me to take my family away. And I don't even know what I'm gonna do, but I'm just gonna decompress, I'm gonna meditate, you know, do some yoga. And after a month or so, we'll figure it out from there. But I need to really bond and reconnect with my family. Next person comes in and you know, they, they just don't give a shit. They're like, all right, whatever, and they leave. And the question is. Who has the right perspective of reality? And everybody does. For the first guy, this really is the end. This is an absolute tragedy. This is the worst thing that has ever happened to him. This guy is probably going to kill me in the car park on my way home tonight and spend the rest of his life in jail. For the next person, this truly is a chance to learn, pick up new skills, maybe take some courses at uni. You know, and come out of this a different person. Who knows, maybe a different industry, maybe a different person within the same industry for the other person. This is really a chance to go on top of a mountain, meditate, like, you know, eat a lot of granola and reconnect and bond with their family and, and, and focus on what's important but is formally neglected. And for the other person, this truly is a non-issue. They don't give a shit, fire me, retain me. I don't really care. I hate this job anyway. And I thought that was a brilliant example. So the, so the reality is, funny enough, uh, ha, depending on who is perceiving it and depending on uh, the individual and how they're viewing things. So is there anything that, um, any way that we could help trainers maybe put things in perspective or is it that um, their reality is their reality. And if this is the worst thing that's ever happened, then it is the worst thing that's ever happened. Or is there a way that we can help people put this in perspective so that they can maybe create some space in their life to start some planning and get some coaching and adaptability? Both. I, I think the answer is both. One, the reality is the reality, but your reality is not the reality to your reality. There are two types of truths in the world. There are absolute truths, and then there are personal truths. 
And the absolute truth is that we are facing a global pandemic and the way that we are responding is very different than the way we responded to anything in at least a century. And we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And that is the reality. Your reality is whatever you believe about yourself and your role that you're playing in the midst of all these changes. And you know, sometimes setting up different odysseys might work for you. So it, it's a mental exercise. You know, get yourself a, a nice big whiteboard or a piece of paper and create a couple of scenarios. And, and it's, it's probably a good idea to do this when we're not having a global pandemic, but especially when we are. <laughs> and write down, if I were going to keep going in this industry and just improve what I'm doing, what would be some of the strategies that I would want to improve? What areas of my current role would I want to get better at? And you know, how, who would I go to to get that assistance, to get that help? And the other scenario, so well, if I was going to do something completely different in the health and fitness industry, what's some roles that you know, I never really considered before, but if my job, the way it exists today, or my business, the way it exists today, was going to morph, this might be a good opportunity for me to reinvent myself and take on a different role within the industry. I mean, some people do that organically. Or, or me, when I was first getting started in the industry, I did that by force, meaning every few months, my boss would fire me in whatever role I was in and allow me to audition for a different role. So as a trainer, I would be, I would be fired. And then I was in management and he'd fire me for management and audition me for a sales position. So that happened to me. I didn't have to proactively engage in that. That's just the way he interacted with me for his own reasons. The third odyssey is what if my entire industry were going to to go away tomorrow. Maybe as I know it or all together and I no longer have the opportunity to work in health and fitness, what would I do? And, and, and work on that and maybe do a brainstorm exercise. Do it with yourself and someone else, preferably somebody who's not in the industry, someone who has a different mental filter. They don't have the same biases and barriers on their creativity that you might have. And someone who's not going to judge your answers and someone who's going to find it fun. And we could go back and forth where I'll throw out an idea, you throw out an idea, come up with 10 ideas for each odyssey and then take a look at it. Because the cool thing is you don't have to get up from the table and go use anything. You can put it on a shelf and leave it there as a resource for next week, next month, or never. Or you can look at that list and say, which one of these moves me the most? Which one of these is alive for me? And do we have it might be three, and out of those three, which one, given my current situation, is most realistic or most accessible for me? And how would I bring this into fruition? So let's say this idea is who I am and where I am one year from today, work backwards. What are all the things that I needed to do in order to bring this to life? Okay, great, there's 10 things. Out of those 10 things, it doesn't have to be 10 things, which one of those things did I do within the course of the year? Which one of those things did I do over the next quarter? Which one of these things might I have done over the next month, week? Which one of those things can I get started on immediately? And so you've provided some great strategies for people in this situation, particularly in the fitness industry. So by going through this activity of brainstorming and kind of asking yourselves these questions and working out a plan, would that have an impact on your level of anxiety and fear and stress? It should. It depends what's causing anxiety, fear, and stress. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't take a linear simplistic approach. Like if you're feeling anxiety, it's because of this. There's a lot of things, but if you're feeling anxiety because you're uncertain, then doing a brainstorm, creating a plan on how to move forward and engaging yourself in taking action 
group should mitigate a lot of that anxiety you're feeling because what you're doing is crystallizing your perception of your locus of control. A lot of times, the, the smaller your perceived locus of control, the more expansive and deep your level of anxiety. And that works in, in the reverse as well. Wow, that, that is amazing, Bobby. I think for trainers to hear that now and to understand that and to give themselves the space and time to do that, I think is gonna be very powerful for them. So thank you so much for your time today, talking about all things adaptability and giving uh, our community, our, our personal trainers and the broader community some great strategies that they can use to keep moving forward in a positive way that works for them. Thank you. Much Beth. love to you, Bobby. Now, what if someone wants to get some coaching or anything from you, or do you have, do you have availabilities? Are you available for coaching? How can they get in touch with you? I'm selectively available for coaching. So um, if, if somebody, if somebody wants to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram. I don't have much of a presence. Social media is, it, 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 it's just not what I resonate with a lot of the times for my own mental health. But you, you can find me there. A lot of people do. Um, the question I would ask, and I will ask if you engage me, is why do you feel that hiring not me or any coach for that matter would give you resources or put you in a better position than just self-discovery and working this stuff out on your own. And that's not a judgment. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you should work stuff out on your own. I believe heavily in coaching, I'll coach, but that's the kind of conversation that we're gonna have because before you hire someone, you should have a very clear idea on your own as to what those answers would be and what your expectations are from a coach and why retaining a coach would put you in a better position than just going through a process of self-discovery. Amazing. Thank you so much, Bobby. And for our community, I will uh, just maybe put a few links to your social media so they can reach out and get in touch with you. Uh, and we- never commented on my mask. Safety right? first, safety first. I mean, do you like it? It's really great. It looks great. <laughs> When I was a kid in school, the other children used to always tell me that my level of physical attractiveness would go up significantly if I just wore a mask over my face. And now I realize 30 years later that they were right. This is massive improvement. Thank you so much, Bobby. I appreciate your time and all the best with your move. Thank you, Mel.